I am uh, Professor Mario Siervo. I am uh, a clinical academic and I recently joined uh, Curtin University uh, in Perth and I have a chair in uh, uh, human nutrition and physiology. Uh, in this talk, I would like to speak a little bit more about my research on nitric oxide. And my interest in nitric oxide really started when I joined the, uh, the, the Cambridge group and uh, I started my work on uh, stable isotopes. And uh, my, my first uh, project was actually to develop a, a novel method, non-invasive method to measure nitric oxide production in humans. And uh, from there, uh, I first got my PhD, but also had this interest in, in uh, nutrition, how nutrition can influence nitric oxide production. And since then, and uh, I, I've been working in uh, testing various nutritional interventions, such as uh, nitrate interventions, and looking at uh, effect of dietary nitrate supplementation on various uh, outcomes, including blood pressure, endothelial function, and more recently have developed an interest in uh, testing the effect of dietary nitrate and uh, manipulation uh, of uh, nitric oxide production uh, on, on brain health. So why nitric oxide? The answer to this question is really, it's very simple. It's a beautiful molecule, I always say, is, uh, is one of those molecules that is so interesting. Uh, it's, it was named Molecule of the Year in 1992, and uh, the scientist that discovered won the Nobel Prize just to give important, importance to the molecule. But essentially what, what it does from my point of view is that it does basically almost everything. It's amenable to, uh, to simple interventions, uh, nutritional interventions and lifestyle interventions, that if they can impact on nitric oxide, it means that the effect that can have on physiological function is basically expanded, is almost exploded. So um, uh, is, uh, uh, nitric oxide has effect on vasodilation, so controlling blood pressure, has effects on immunity, has effect on metabolism by manipulation of, by influencing uh, mitochondrial function, particularly increasing uh, muscular efficiency uh, and uh, and the muscular performance, for example. And as part of that, the interest of the brain is really linked to the um, to the effect on nitric oxide it has on metabolism, particularly in terms of supporting the metabolism of neurons, but also of other cells in the brain but also regulation of immunity in the brain, but also involved in, for example, in neurotransmission and uh, uh, synaptic uh, plasticity, so better functioning uh, of the brain. And my research has really exploited these multiple actions of, of nitric oxide, and uh, we started to look first at the, at the effect of nitrate uh, supplementation in older individuals, overweight and obesity and obese and looking at, um, uh, at the effect of uh, nitro supplementation on cognitive function but also on cerebral blood flow. Um, the study was uh, looking also at the testing of whether the incremental doses of uh, nitrate, dietary nitrate supplementation would also create greater benefit on cardiovascular and cognitive outcomes. So the results showed a trend, not significant, but a trend for improvement in cerebral blood flow. And we're now following this up uh, in terms of a new, new study. And we, we believe that possibly uh, a new area, particularly in terms of obesity as a risk factor for, for dementia, could be the combination of uh, caloric restriction, for example, with uh, nitro supplementation. Uh, one of the studies we are currently conducting, for example, is to test whether uh, combining caloric restriction and uh, dietary nitrate supplementation in overweight and, uh, and obese older subjects would produce greater uh, improvement in uh, cognitive function and also cerebral blood flow uh, in, the, uh, in the subjects after uh, compared to caloric restriction alone. We will explore in details uh, using uh, state-of-the-art measurement tools uh, like computerized uh, cognitive, cognitive testing or uh, magnetic resonance imaging in terms of looking at cerebral blood flow, also uh, oxygen extraction 
uh, from uh, from uh, from brain and also in terms of effect on uh, and the relationship with changes in blood pressure and also endothelial function. So these studies have been supported also by an extensive work that we've done in my group and uh, in terms of systematic reviewing and meta-analysis. That's another expertise uh, that we have in my group, uh, where we showed actually that uh, um, dietary nitro supplementation uh, is overall associated with uh, an improved uh, um, uh, improved cognition across the, the, the various studies that we conducted, and also any, uh, a, a trend for an improvement in uh, cerebral blood flow. Um, one of the primary characteristics, and I think this is the scope for the future, particularly in terms of nutritional interventions, which emerged from the uh, from the systematic review meta-analysis that we conducted, it was that essentially. Uh, there is a, a, a lack of response of uh, dietary nitrate uh, supplementation, uh, particularly in subjects that they are um, um, not at a risk. And that has been one of the main limitations, for example, of the studies that have reported uh, non-significant results. So essentially, the recommendation for, for future studies, in uh, particularly in the field of dietary nitrate, and also in, in terms of uh, try to um, improve nitric oxide production is to have target populations that may be more prone to respond uh, to the interventions uh, in the context of the, the brain. And this is part of also the nutritional strategy that has been recommended by the Lancet Commission on Nutrition and Prevention of Dementia. Essentially, greater emphasis should be on the selection of the, uh, of, of the patients and, and the, uh, the population in terms of, uh, in terms of risk uh, for, for dementia and, uh, and cognitive impairment, as well as a, a clear um, understanding of the efficacy of the interventions. Um, so my group, for example, has demonstrated that um, all the subjects may be less sensitive to uh, to dietary nitrate, to, to, to lower doses of dietary nitrate, perhaps a tailored, uh, tailored interventions in individuals possibly of older age that is needed. And the other aspect, particularly in the brain, is the length of duration uh, and the duration of the, of the interventions. While we have some responses in the short term, most of the study conducted particularly in, uh, in the short term basically been reporting not significant results. So essentially study a longer duration to allow for changes in cognition and particularly changes in brain function are needed. We have done a study looking at those response, particularly com combining and trying to answer the effects, well, the relationship with the duration of the studies. Um, so we uh, did incremental doses of dietary nitrate starting from placebo, and then uh, one uh, group was randomized to uh, alt alternate days of uh, the bitter juice. Uh, another group uh, was randomized to um, a single dose of bitter juice, but every day. And the last group was randomized to uh, two doses of bitter juice essentially was a kind of an incremental dose from around 150 milligrams per day for the alternate days to 300 milligrams per day uh, for the uh, single dose, single daily dose to about 600 milligrams. Uh, but this was continued for 13 weeks, which when we published the study was the uh, longest study. But what we found, and this is, this is what uh, I had a kind of a primary outcome was the changes in cognition and, uh, and uh, cerebral blood flow, but it wasn't measured by the M um, MRI, it was measured by near-infrared spectroscopy, which is a less sensitive uh, type of technique. Still valid, but um, I would say less sensitive, and it was mostly focused on the uh, prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, so it was also limited in terms of uh, investigation of the, uh, the, the, other, the other areas of the brains, um, which uh, 
can be uh, is is clearly the advantage of the MRI in terms of the looking at the whole brain and uh, and then separation of the effect in the various and the various areas of the brain, particularly in terms of uh, areas that are more involved in in terms of memory formation, like the uh, the hippocampus, for example. For, for a style like this, I think we have to go, and that's what we try to do. Uh, we have to go for at least six months. The actual Lancet Commission on uh, Nutrition uh, nutrition and Prevention of Dementia, they recommend one year uh, to look, to basically some have some evidence of changes in cognition and changes in brain function. Uh, I think we, uh, as a minimum, I would say for uh, looking at the brain, we should look at least at six months interventions. Uh, um, before that, I think we'll be very likely to have um, to, to have non-significant results. That should be part of the strategy, particularly when we look at the effect on, in this in this case, not dietary natural intervention and uh, and uh, and changes in cognition. I think you can look at both ways. One is looking not directly at the brain but looking at risk factors for uh for cognitive impairment and uh, and uh, and dementia risk so essentially a uh, any a more impaired cardiometabolic health i think probably will give better chances in terms of uh possibly changes in cardiometabolic health and indirectly uh changes in in, in brain health and cognition um I think greater emphasis, I think, for this one, and there is, I believe, nothing in the literature so far, it's uh, to try to um, recruit people with uh, um, a, a cognitive impairment. Um, most of the trials, they uh, they focus on nutritional interventions, they focus on uh, kind of early stage of cognitive impairment. Is it, um, like for example, MCI, mild, mild cognitive impairment, with defined criteria in terms of memory complaint, and uh, and uh, uh, so it can be easily screened. Uh, the, the problem is that when introduce this uh, this uh, this screening criteria, recruiter may become more difficult. You need to be, uh, you have to have a, a, a larger team, particularly involving a multidisciplinary team in terms of clinical neuropsychologists or old age psychiatrist in terms of helping with the recruiting process. Um, so uh, I think it becomes more complicated, but certainly doable, certainly feasible. And I think certainly the direction of where we need to take in order to provide more robust evidence on the effect of uh, nutritional interventions, but more specifically in this case, dietary natural interventions and, and prevention of cognitive impairment and dementia. Right, I, I, I think the, um, from my point of view as a nutritionist, I see the, the nitrate more amenable, I think, uh, in terms of nutritional interventions, particularly when you want to transpose from uh, a supplementation type of formulation to, uh, to a dietary pattern. So that's the work that we're also doing, for example, that um, uh, we, we're trying to develop high nitrate dietary patterns that they're more close to what people can do in their real life, essentially, yes, it, it's uh, it's important to make sure that people uh, and population have adequate nutrition and, and also in terms of nutrients, and they meet the requirements of these nutrients. But uh, ultimately, we want to encourage them to, to, to follow a healthy diet. And I think nitrate is one of the key components of the healthy diet. I, I think, um, uh, you know, when we look at healthy dietary patterns, like Mediterranean diet or DASH diet, uh, some of the elements that these uh, healthy dietary patterns have with proven effect on cardiometabolic health and also uh, on brain health, uh, they have overall an increase in vegetable intake and most of them, they will have a high nitric content. So I think that's uh, one of my, um, the, the, the other aspect is that uh, it's closely linked. I mean, the established, 
pathway in terms of nitrate and nitrite and uh, the conversion is in, into, uh, into nitric oxide is a proven pathway. Um, so um, I think it's, uh, um, yeah, that, that, that will be my, my main reason really. My work spans from um, epidemiology and trying to look at, for example, at epidemiological at large data sets and uh, possibly moving to more mechanistic type of studies, particularly in, 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 in large data sets, and try to combine, uh, for example, um, the availability of, of large data sets, large populations with the more advanced techniques like GWAS looking at genotyping an effect, for example, on, uh, on nitric oxide, some in terms of the, uh, some, some, of, some in terms of some polymorphisms for, um, for, for genes that are associated with nitric oxide production. Um, for example, Mendelian randomization studies that would be so interesting to do, particularly looking at uh, some of the, you know, ENOS or the ADENOS enzymes uh, in, in terms of uh, established polymorphisms that we know that they can relate to a, a, a decrease in nitric oxide production and see whether that would relate also into uh, uh, different outcomes or different associations uh, with, uh, with disease risk or uh, in general with, um, uh, with physiological outcomes. The other aspect I, 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 I would like and I have a developed lab, it's really biomarkers. I, I think it's, uh, um, I have a, a lab which uh, specialized in uh, biomarkers of endothelial function and nitric oxide production. I develop a method, as I said at the beginning, uh, during my introductions, that uh, uses stable isotopes for measurement of whole body nitric oxide production. Uh, we need sensitive biomarkers in order to assess the efficacy of the interventions. And I think that's, uh, that's key also in, uh, in the development of the field. Uh, in terms of strengths, uh, in strengths of the field and the robustness of the evidence that we can produce. 